So welcome and uh, welcome back. It's been a long winter and we're good to be back. Uh, glad to be back. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Laura Weiss. She is a DVM CVH and she owns an integrative small animal practice in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. And her veterinary practice is limited to homeopathy and nutrition. And she sees dogs, cats, and chickens. So I was very interested in that because on our farm, um, over the years, we've had dogs and cats and chickens. So, I mean, she's our kind of practitioner. So, um, she's going to be telling us about animal emotions and homeopathic prescribing. Thank you, Laura. Thanks so much, Bob. Um, and again, I can't see anybody there. So, if there's any questions, please jump in. And there's a, a place in the webinar here where we can, um, I'm going to be uh, gathering some input from everybody. So um, in addition to chickens, I also see a lot of wildlife, but we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. So thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, in addition to that, I'm also one of the co-founders of the Veterinary Homeopathy Institute. Let me see if I can get the slides to go here. Hmm. All right, one moment. There we go. So just a one second plug for that. The mission of that um, a new program that we founded is to grow and support the veterinary homeopathic community. Um, and we do have a foundations course that is going to be running this summer. Um, we're also going to be providing advanced um, education in through webinars. Goodness, every time I click off the slides, there we go. So a little bit more about me. Um, I started out as all veterinarians do as a conventional vet that is that is how our training goes but i was always very interested in animal behavior and animal emotions and i incorporated animal behavior into my undergraduate degree um, and did research projects studying sociality in prosimian primates with field work um, primarily observing captive primates in a large primate center the 1990s, after I graduated, saw a lot of really big changes in the field of studying animal emotions. And there was some discussion and some recognition, finally, of the similarity of the emotional lives of human and non-human animals. But during vet school and for much of the next years of practice, and even during my veterinary homeopathy training, I set aside that focus on animal emotions and at most thought about and discussed animal behavior, which is very different. So after I, I finished my veterinary homeopathy training, um, I wanted to learn more about homeopathy and I enrolled in a four year course of study of human homeopathy. I'm in my fourth and final year. And as you all know, in human homeopathy, the emotional symptoms are just as important, if not more so than the physical symptoms. And so over the last three years, I've returned to this field of study, um, deepening my understanding of the emotional lives of animals. So in addition to currently working as a small animal veterinarian, I'm also the primary care veterinarian for a large wildlife um, rescue and rehabilitation center that primarily uses homeopathy as their mode of treatment. So why are we focusing on emotions? Going back to the organon, aphorism 210, Hahnemann tells us that in all the so-called somatic diseases as well, the mental and emotional frame of mind is always altered in all cases of disease to be cured the patient's emotional state should be noted as one of the most preeminent symptoms, along with the symptoms complex, if one wants to record a true image of the disease in order to be able to cure it homeopathically. In animals, we're used to focusing on the somatic. In vet school and in our first jobs, we were all taught how to disregard all of that extraneous information that pet parents always wanted to tell us about their pets and just focus on the physical issues. You know, it's true. We cannot elucidate sensations well. An animal can't tell you the nature of their pain. Is it stabbing? Is it dull? Is it piercing? Is it wave-like, pressing, etc.? And the dogma is that emotions are too complex to understand in animals. You can look at animal behavior, but not animal emotions. Hahnemann goes on to tell us that the emotional symptoms are so important that they can often help you decide between or among remedies and tip the scale in one direction or another. I think that as he states, 
it's important for us all to be exactly observing physicians. And I think when we're studying in the veterinary realm and looking at our animal companions, this perhaps is even more true. Finally, Hahnemann tells us in aphorism 213 that we're never going to cure in accordance with nature. That is one will never cure homeopathically unless one, we attend to the symptoms of the mental and emotional alterations together with the other symptoms in every case of disease, even acute ones. And two, for aid, one selects from among the remedies a disease potency that along with the similarity of its other symptoms with those of the disease is of itself capable of engendering a mental or emotional state similar to that of the disease. So what are emotions? We're gonna spend a little bit of time on this slide. Do they start in the body and then the mental part comes next? Or do they start as a thought that drives a physiological response? In the molecules of emotion, Candace Pert says that the body is the unconscious mind and that the brain is a bag of hormones. There's a two-way communication between the body and the brain. Mark Beckoff, who is a biology professor at University of Colorado, and more importantly, a leader in cognitive ethology, describes emotions as physiological phenomena that help in behavioral management and control. Now that sounds pretty difficult to unravel there. So he goes on to say that emotion is so general that it escapes any single definition. Emotions are sometimes described as the body responding to external stimuli. Imagine how you feel when a strange dog suddenly runs at you. And feelings are physiological. So they happen inside of us. And we interpret then our feelings and our emotions. And sometimes it's so difficult to define them exactly that some people have linked just the recognition of the emotion to the famous 1964 quote by Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart when he defined pornography and he said, I know it when I see it. But beyond these thorny questions of what exactly are emotions, we can go a little bit deeper and look at the question of do animals experience emotions? So the Pythagoreans way back, fourth century BCE, did believe that animals experience the same range of emotions that people do. But moving forward, that viewpoint was really flipped upside down by Rene Descartes in the 1600s, and then B.F. Skinner, who was a behaviorist in the early 1900s, and their followers. They said, animals basically are robots. They're conditioned to respond automatically to stimuli which they're exposed to. So why are there so many competing views on animals and emotions? Some people view humans as unique animals who are created in the image of God and the only creatures who are capable of self-reflection. And this was compounded at the end of the 19th century by the up and coming hard sciences, like chemistry and physics, which led to an emulation of what was happening in, in those areas in other fields. So researchers who were studying animal behavior realized there was not much research on animal emotions and minds and so they focused on data that was directly measurable, observable, verifiable, such as overt behavioral actions. Any talk of animal emotions was frowned upon as unscientific. Now, more recently in the last 30 years, researchers have addressed the challenge of learning more about animal minds and behavior and believe it is possible to study these areas. Most researchers now, believe that emotions are not just a result of a bodily state causing an action, but instead they recognize that there is a mental component that does not have to follow a bodily reaction. All right, time to wake up after all that theory and let's have a little bit of a quiz. This is where it'd be great to have some audience participation. So I went through these slides, I picked out these, these animal photos and I went through these slides with my sons who are one of their in their late teens and early 20s and they've all grown up with animals and they got all but one of the emotions based upon these photos so darwin originally postulated that there were six universal emotions so does anybody know what this emotional state is or can you take a guess fear 
Yeah, I think it's very closely linked to that. I was thinking this is anger, but I agree those ears back could be fear. So anger and fear are both those basic emotions that Darwin postulated. How about this one? Happy. Yay, yes, happiness. And this one. Sadness. 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 Yeah, sadness. This is the one that's a little harder. <laughs> You're right, it's a cat. <laughs> this one's, yeah, to me, this one was like disgust. Like, I am so done with you. <laughs> <laughs> and this is another one. I think it's very similar to that first one. We We often talk about fear-based aggression in this one you can see what we call whale eyes that that little pup is is pretty worried about that person oh, yeah, here. Yeah. this one <laughs> i don't know that this al is actually expressing this emotion but i think this is this is an anthropomorphism of this emotion Surprise. yeah Surprise. exactly you guys are great Okay, so in a natural history of human emotions, um, Stuart Walton added those emotions on the left, jealousy, contempt, shame, embarrassment, and sympathy. And then in Descartes' error, um, Antonio Damasio, another researcher in this field, also put in guilt, pride, envy, admiration, and indignation which I think that cat might be showing that, but I think a lot of cats show disgust and indignation a lot. So what I think is really interesting is that none of these seminal researchers talked about love. It's one of our most written about, sung about, talked about emotions. And in, in our veterinary world, we recognize love of an animal for another animal, companion or familial, love of an animal for a person, and certainly vice versa, love of our clients for their animals that they share their lives with. So before we delve into any more theory and background, let's do a case. This is Scout, Scout the Wonder Dog. He is owned by a woman at Prometheus Homeopathic Institute who's in the class behind me. So Scout's a 12 year old male neutered little terrier mix and the physical symptoms that he presented with were elevated and increasing renal values. He'd started peeing in the house, he was vomiting occasionally. And all of his life, he'd had chronic intermittent itchy skin eruptions and ear discharges. So his mom had prescribed phosphorus um, and didn't have much effect. So some other notable things from Scout's case when I did his intake and I said, you know, I asked a question I often ask, I said, what's this little guy like? You know, I can read your labs and I can do a physical exam. Now tell me about Scout. Help me get a good feeling of who he is. And some of the things that she said were, I've had him since he was a puppy. He's trained on an invisible fence. And here his mom started choking up. And, and I said, well, tell me more about that. And she said, I cried. It beeped as a warning, but we had to let him experience the shock. Now he's wary of all beeps and the kids toys make beeping noises. He's always been that dog who wants order and routine. I said, well, how does he behave if that routine is disrupted? And she says, he paces, he's restless, he hides. He also had the, in, the, the very bad habit of biting strangers in the house if they disrupted his routine. She said, he'll come to us if he's nervous, but otherwise he's okay doing his own thing. He's not bold. He needs reassurance. So there are more than 73 homeopathic remedies listed in the rubric for renal insufficiency and failure. So how do we choose the right one? For Scout, as for most of my patients, the answer is to look at how Scout is unique individually, mentally, and emotionally. So Scout was prescribed for Senecum album 200C, followed by Q1 or LM1. 
And he's had to have occasional repetitions of the 200C, especially when they had um, a big disruption in the house and they had construction going on, which really threw him for a loop. Um, but Scout now, this is this is a little old, this presentation, so I actually talked to his mom a, a week ago and his renal values have stabilized. They stabilized in about three months on the remedy. Um, he has no fear of the noises. The kids' beeping toys roll right past him. He's slowly warming up to strangers. He has no accidents in the house. And she described him as thriving. So this is Scout living his best life. So of course, with our Arsenicum album, some of the keynotes that we're looking at are those feelings of loneliness and isolation, seeing the world as threatening and chaotic, which was certainly Scout's original viewpoint and the suspicion, the cautiousness, the anxiousness, and the fear. So let's go back to why are we so reluctant to use these symptoms and why have we been cautioned against them? And, and the, one of the worries is, is um, falling into the trap of anthropomorphism, which is the elephant in the room, so to speak. So anthropomorphism is, is attributing human characteristics of behavior to non-human entities, including animals. So in this cartoon, I don't know if you can read it, one horse is saying to the other, so then I said, sit wherever you like, just get off my back. And the other horse is laughing. The dog says, I don't get it. And I'm like, hey, talking dog. So it's really all about our perception and it's all about what we think is normal. So anthropomorphism in the 19, in the, in the 1990s, excuse me, was noted that when we use human terms to explain animal or emotions or feelings, it really helps us to make that animal's world more accessible. But it doesn't discount that an animal's experience may not be identical to ours. So we can, we can do what's called biocentrically anthropomorphic science and still do rigorous science. So how do we apply this perspective? I think observation, observation, observation. Remember Hahnemann's comment on the exactly observing physician. We can observe our patients' expressions, how they come into our exam rooms, how they interact with their, their owners or their pet parents, how they are in their homes, if we're lucky enough to see them there. We can look at their body language and a host of other small and large details. Like this kitty, this kitty's a little cautious, a little worried, not fearful. You're not seeing those ears going all the way back, but he's ready to run if need be. So each species has universal body language cues and some that are unique to that species. Understanding what the animal is feeling is partly predicated on understanding what is normal for that species. So these are dog body language cues. And going from the left, you can see first in the most relaxed state. And they purposefully are just showing an outline here. You don't even need in looking at body language necessarily to look at the face or to look at the eyes. That first dog is relaxed. The second one's doing a, a play bell there. The third one down is excited, reaching out. That top middle one is calm and neutral. You can see the ears are cocked forward a little bit. The body is relaxed. Compare that to the one right underneath where the ears are forward. The mouth is open a little bit. The whole body is leaning forward. The next um, outline below is where sometimes people make mistakes. They think, oh, that's a playful one. Look, the tail's up. But compare that to the playful one on the left. You can see here the bodies, the, the shoulders are spread wide. That tail is up. And it's, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to show that I am big and I might be the boss of you. It's not necessarily a fearful animal, though. We start to move into that realm on the next picture down, where that dog is, is starting to be a little bit aggressive. Tail's straight out now. It's not up. And the, the body is crouching away just a little bit. And then we move really into the realm of fear on the right side, where that, 
that almost looks like a mouse, doesn't it? Where the, the, the body is completely crouched. I'm trying to make myself smaller, even smaller still on the next one. Tails going from up to straight to down to now tucked. And then finally into the bottom one, which is listed as a submissive posture rolling over. If that's a dog that you share a house with or who knows you well, that's also uh, rub my belly. <laughs> we call it in my house, the cockroach pose. <laughs> so how about some other species? We'll go through these um, pretty quickly. In the cat ones on the left, um, the only thing that they've altered, well, the primary thing that they've altered is that tail position. So on the top left, the cat's poofed, the ears are back. I'm scared, but I'm trying to look like I'm bigger. In the next one, the cat's curious, tails up. And then the one under that, the cat feels pretty relaxed, the tails down in a neutral position. It's so interesting. And it's it's the, you know, the tail position tells us so much about these animals, whether it's up and I'm happy or hmm, I'm interested, or just like the dog, I'm worried, I'm gonna tuck that tail. Some children I have to tell in the exam room when they say, oh, my cat's happy, it's wagging its tail, that top right picture. No, 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 cats don't wag their tails. That's the twitching, I'm starting to really lose it and get annoyed. As compared to the bottom right one, see the difference between the top left and the bottom right? The, again, they're both, I'm, I'm trying to look bigger, tails all puffed up, but in the bottom right one, that's our typical Halloween cat there. I am really pissed at this point. I'm not just scared, I am I am angry. Horses are a little bit different. Horses are prey species, and so they have universal body cues associated with that, um, that you know, aspect of their biology. So what we're looking at here is not just tail position, but more, how is the head positioned? Which way is the body turned? Is Are they ready to run? Um, in the top one, you can see that that back leg is cocked up a little bit. That, that horse is completely relaxed. Whereas in the next picture down, they're looking around like, hey, what's going on here? In the one underneath, I'm sorry, these are a little hard to read. It says, will I or won't I? That neck is up and curved. Whereas the the bay, the brown horse with the black markings down underneath, he's like, hmm, mm, this, is, this is starting to worry me a little bit. My leg's up, I'm getting ready to run. And then in the bottom one, boop, that's it, they're off. Whereas in the right side, the horse is trying to make itself look smaller. You see how that, that that neck is down hey i'm trying to look like i'm not threatening here I, i'm out of your way do you want to be friends whereas in the third picture down on the right the neck is up the tail is up and that horse is trying to again i'm i'm trying to take a little control here and that advances down in the next two pictures of i'm i'm starting to lose it i'm getting annoyed and in the bottom one that horse reminds me almost of a snake it's neck is extended and out, it's gonna bite. It's almost like you can hear that, that um, horse starting to hiss. So just a little bit more, we're gonna take those um, emotions, remember from um, Darwin, the original six emotions, and just look at it in the eyes and the facial expression. So remember the dogs were domesticated about 30,000 years ago, but I, I actually just heard a report, I think, um, that put that date even a little bit earlier. So we can read a dog's facial expressions and they can read ours. And that has been demonstrated again and again in clinical trials. So look at these photos. That first one, the, the dog's laughing, he's happy, he's relaxed, the mouth is open. In the next one, dog's a little worried, he's a little sad, I think you're going out, you're gonna leave me. And then look at the third one, afraid. You can see that that whale eye we talk about with the whites of the eyes showing and the ears are going back a little bit. In the surprise look, <laughs> the dog doesn't know quite what to expect. What did you just do? Disgusted, I think that's hard to capture on a dog, but that's like you just offer that dog something gross, like, hey, do you want some spinach? And the dog was expecting something better. 
And then finally, in that angry dog, I think we can all recognize that the head is thrust forward. It's got that snake-like um, aspect to it. I'm stretching my neck out and it's very focused. The eyes are very hard. They're not soft and happy like they are in that upper left. All right, so let's go do another case now. This is Kitty. Privately, I call her Bad Kitty. <laughs> she came to me as a one-year-old. Um, she had been a shelter kitty. She was found as a stray, and she'd been vaccinated, spayed, dewormed, and given antibiotics for an upper respiratory virus. I hoped everyone at least blinked when they heard all of that litany, all done within 24 hours. One week later, she developed asthma. It was diagnosed on the basis of clinical signs and radiograph. She was treated conventionally, and she would only improve when she was on oral steroids. She came to our clinic and was first treated by one of my colleagues with Chinese herbs, but trying to get herbs into bad Samantha was really impossible, and she did not improve. So one of the home advantages to homeopathic medications in cats, of course, is that they are odorless and tasteless and fairly easy to dose, even in bad kitties. I was very new as a homeopath when I started working with Kitty, and I had treated her with a few different remedies based on various reparations, finally um, using sulfur. And sulfur was, she responded curatively to sulfur. She was on a 30C potency and then a 200C potency dose twice. And she was symptom free for two years. And then two years later, she came back. And she's one of those cases that you don't hear from. And I don't know, you know, did did she just get worse and the owner left? <laughs> or is she totally fine? But two years later, they show up, they're like, no, we had no reason to call you. She was great. Um, but she had started intermittent vomiting. She seemed to be sensitive to certain proteins. And as time went on, her owners were able to pinpoint several food sensitivities. She also developed this mucoid eye discharge that you see in this photo, and she was itchy all over. So we went back to sulfur, but she had absolutely no improvement or response. So again, just looking at the physicals, they are, even putting this all together, there are hundreds of remedies that address vomiting and itchiness and ocular discharge. These are all very common symptoms. So how do we decide the next step? So let me tell you about Bad Kitty. She had always been a bold and assertive cat, but her behavior had worsened when she started the vomiting. She had unprovoked attacks on people in the house and visitors. And when I say attacks, I mean, she would stalk them and run up and bite them on the leg. And she had drawn blood. She would have these episodes of just like wild behavior and violent lashing out. And her owner said, you know, they say, I said, well, tell me more about it. What's it like? And they said, it's, it's, she's like, she's seeing ghosts or she's being attacked. She shrieked and she howled. She, she was definitely worse in the dark. And she went after me in the exam room several times. She looks pretty innocent there, doesn't she? Yeah. <laughs> Who, me? So... Based on her symptoms, repertorizing and including the mental and emotional, I prescribed stramonium. And of course, that has keynotes of, of screaming, terrified, violent rages, delusion, she's being attacked or injured, and fear of the dark. She got 200 C1 dose, which was repeated five months later when she started to have a mild return of symptoms. Her vomiting and her ocular discharge resolved, but you can tell from this picture, she is still planning mischief. <laughs> this is the, this is her, her, they adopted another cat, Sniffers, um, and, and they are, they are now partners in crime, but now it's more regular kitty crime. So how else can we understand animal emotions? In addition to direct observation, I think one of the most important things that we need to do is write down the exact language of the animal caretaker. Many people are so in tune with their animals that their language will lead you to the rubrics. That language is most important when it, often when they're not describing the physical symptoms, it comes in relaxed conversation, when they understand that you really want to get to know their animal as an individual. 
So let's see an example of this language in the case of Princess. Princess came to me at the end of her life. She came in with a laundry list of physical ailments. She's an 18-year-old female spade Persian. She had a liver mass, which had been ultrasounded a number of times and was rapidly growing. She suffered from hyperthyroidism. Her, her, her kidneys were not doing well. She had renal insufficiency. She had inflammatory bowel disease. She was losing weight. Her appetite was on and off and she'd chronically been on methimazole and prednisolone. When her owner came in, her first comment to me, and I had seen a couple of her other animals, was she is failing. So who is Princess? She came from a house that had multiple cats and dogs, and her owners described, for example, she said, when one of my dogs who is very grumpy, would go after any of the other animals, Princess would always intervene. She'd smack the dog on the nose repeatedly. It was like she's scolding him. She could be very grumpy and angry at times herself, but she said it's more in a, this is for your own good in a mothering kind of way. Her owner's language included some of the um, quotes that you see on the screen. She's the matriarch of my tribe. She scolds the other animals. Her moods alternate between kitten-like and exhaustion. She said she seems to be losing her memory and it's like the other animals are her daughters. I tried a few different remedies based primarily on Princess's physical symptoms, but had very little success. Now, this was one of the times when I did not come to my remedy through repertization. I was in the midst of studying and one of the um remedies kept ringing a bell and I, I couldn't understand why until i realized it really strongly resembled princess so i prescribed lax luxidanta africana milk of the african elephant and the keynote essence of this remedy is that this is the matriarch who holds the group together so so many of this patient's physical symptoms had moved from sensation to function, to firmly entrenched structural alterations by the time I saw her, the prescribing on those symptoms really didn't seem to capture the essence of this cat. I would have been prescribing on pathology. The main effects that we saw from this remedy were a stabilizing of appetite and weight. She became a lot more peaceful, less quarrelsome. She still retained her place at the head of the household, but it didn't seem, her owner said, like she exerted as much energy to do, say, to do so. She became more of a benign mother figure. Her owner would call me when Princess seemed to be slipping. We redose. And at the end of her life, she gave Princess several doses in water. Her last days were very peaceful. And, and when her owner called to let me know that she had passed, it really gave me goosebumps. She said she died at home, surrounded by the other members of her animal tribe which is just like what we read about in, in um, accounts of, of elephants. So another method that I use at times um, is listening for the energy of the case in statements of similarities. And you probably all heard people and their pets start to look like each other. And I sure hope that's not true because one of my pets is a French bulldog like this puppy here. But I have found that in many cases, people and their animals share mental and emotional traits. I don't have an explanation for this. Do we choose animals like us? Do they choose us? Do we take on each other's states when we live so closely together? I don't know. Do we simply sympathetically resonate with each other? And do we identify traits in our animals that we also possess? Well, whatever it is, you know, I, I, I wish I had a dollar or something for every time um, that I hear an animal caretaker when as as I repeat something to them or ask for a clarification, or I'll say, you know, I'm hearing blah, blah, blah. They'll say, you know, now that I think about it, he behaves just like me or he has the same fears that I do. So this brings us to the case of Charlie. I've been seeing Charlie for about four years. 
she is from a rescue. She was adopted as a pup. Charlie's owners dote on her and love her. She has read a really super life, but when she came to me, she had some physical symptoms. She is now a five-year-old female spade, small lab mix. She had had chronic soft stool. She was gaining weight, now overweight. She had seasonal allergies that manifest as itchy skin and ears. And she had chronic anal sac distension, which led her to scoot. And when I saw her at one year of age, um, she was on steroids and a hypoallergenic diet. So Charlie's mental and emotional picture, she absolutely loves her walks. She's gentle, she's submissive. That's where you get this language. She's so timid and afraid, just like me. We both have anxiety. It's I can't figure her out. She's always changing. No two days are the same. The world can be a scary place. Charlie needs us and she's better with us just like we are with her. Now, Charlie had never been treated with anything but love and kindness, but she was anxious and timid. The thing that really stood out in this case that Charlie was so similar to her owner, and this came from her owner's observations, not from mine. Look at her body language in this photo and think about some of those pictures that we looked at. She's so nervous. Look at her ears, her posture, her crouch. She's trying to make herself as little as possible. Don't notice me. Maybe you won't hurt me. So Charlie's treatment with me started when I wasn't paying as much attention to mental and emotional symptoms. She'd been on phosphorus. She'd been on her Senecum album just from looking at her physical picture and thinking about her anxieties as confirmatory. When I flipped my approach around and thought about her mental and emotional life as being as important as her physicals, if not more so, I prescribed pulsatilla. So keynotes of this remedy, of course, are mild and yielding, better with consolation, timid and fearful. Remember when our owner said that every day is different? It's just like that windflower bending to every single gust of wind. So she was prescribed Pulsatilla 200C, followed by Q1 through Q3 over a one-year period of time with some pauses in treatment. So as we progressed through that first year, Charlie became dramatically better. We were able to get her off steroids, and she now eats a home-prepared diet. Um, one of her owners is Polish and the other Russian. And so she gets lots and lots of, of, um, foods <laughs> that are, are native. And, um, she does experience seasonally very rare and occasional flares in her allergy symptoms, but they're mild and, and a lot of times we don't even need to treat. But the really interesting thing to me is that she has such increased confidence. Um, instead of just going on walks with her owners, now she plays with the children in the neighborhood and she is a different dog now when she comes into the practice. And one final case I wanna talk about is Baron. So with animals, just as with you know, there's the additional work of translating the language of homeopathic texts into a language that makes sense for animals. And I found this takes a, quite a bit of practice. I remember how awkward it seemed um, when I was just learning homeopathy and needed to learn the old medical terms that are still sprinkled through the materia medica and repertory. Or going back further than that, when I had to learn the language of medicine and anatomy as a veterinary student. Well, now it's all second nature. And I think that translating animal motions can become as second nature to us as well. So that brings us to Baron. Baron was also a rescue. He was a two, he is now a two-year-old male neutered mastiff mix. Um, he was found as an emaciated stray. He was chained to a fence. Um, he was taken to a high kill shelter, scheduled for euthanasia. He had a last minute adoption. His presenting complaint were deep cracks in the skin on his paw pads and in his hind limbs. Um, he's a little unsettling in the exam room. He's very huge and he behaves in a very dominant fashion. So 
this is just an example of looking at just, you know, um, I, I use um, radar primarily. So just looking at the symptom of, of cracked soles, worse from um, the weather, I put in, you know, cracks, fissures, chaps after washing, and looking at the remedies that come up. And I want to compare that now to the original prescription he got was sulfur. 200 C, he really didn't respond much. And he would have this pattern. The cracks would heal about 80 to 90%, and then they would reopen. So the owner was also applying calendula cream topically. And then I found out also giving oral calendula 6C daily. So I said, okay, you want to do this? Let's do this for, you know, three, four months, see how it goes. Same pattern. They would heal 80%, 90%, and then they'd open up again. So let's see who is baron and baron's dad loves him takes him everywhere with him baron's dad's a contractor so he rides around and in, in the front of the truck and he says he's a really really good dog he's just scared here and he tries to put on this big show but he's actually nervous so the funny thing about baron is that baron lives with three little chihuahuas at home and they said he's so gentle with the little ones they call them the littles at home they rule the roost and at home he thinks he's one of the little guys he tries to sit on your lap he's just scared of some people he doesn't realize how big and strong he is he's afraid of a lot of situations so we see these dichotomous situations or statements excuse me in baron this picture of big and small gentle and dominant um, of fear and, and dominance. So translating into the language of homeopathy, here are some descriptions of that mental and emotional picture. Mind dictatorial, mind cowardice, mind fear of people, mind want of self-confidence. And if you remember back to just looking at the physicals there, like a podium certainly was um well represented and like a podium has cracks in the hind feet as one of its keynotes and we all know like a podium club moss and thinking about the history of mosses you know 300 million years ago mosses towered you know 120 130 feet tall dominated the vegetation now there are these little tiny plants and i find it a great way to remember the polarities in this remedy keynotes lack of self-confidence present themselves differently than they feel inside and and it's so interesting right baron's owner knew all this he knew what he was like he was able to tell me that and that's all the language that as a veterinary student i was taught to ignore so baron was prescribed like a podium 200 c followed by q1 um, he only took two doses of the Q1 because Baron had an aggravation reaction. Um, his paws became quite red and swollen, um, and he didn't want to walk on him for a couple of days. And however, as time has unfolded and we're now several months down the road, he's doing great. The skin on his pads has finally healed. It looks great. And now we're watching to see how, you know, his, his behavior um, unfolds. The interesting thing is that I'm not afraid of many dogs in the exam room, but when Baron would come in, it would make the, the hair on the back of my neck stand up a little bit. And now I, I don't have that experience with him when he comes in for his rechecks. So just those really subtle postural and behavioral cues that if we pay attention to what we're feeling and what we're noticing can tell us a world about um, a patient, those have changed in how he presents now. So that's everything I have for you today. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present on this. I love this topic. Um, and what's really interesting to me is now as I, as I work with more and more people, um, I've had the real pleasure and opportunity of working with um, people and some of their pets and watching that process unfold and seeing how they both change in their interactions with each other has been a real pleasure. This is one of the deer that um, we fostered for a bit before she was 
released back into the wild. This was her and her first day in, and part of our job was to de-acclimate her to people. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out or I'm happy to answer any right now. Laura, I have a couple of questions. This is uh, Tim Fior. Hi there. First of all, I wanted to say thank you. Uh, this is a very interesting um, that, you know, homeopathy, it, you know, it's great for people. We know that's what we do when we treat people here. And the fact that it also works on animals in almost the same way with the emotions, it's like, it's kind of a, a hint at how, how powerful the, you know, the, this law of similars is, how it goes through mm -hmm. animals people. It's amazing. Um, the question I have, first of all, about the dosing, uh, it's interesting you give a 200C and then a, a Q potency. Uh, where did you pick that up from? Why, why do you do that? So it, there's, there's sometimes, you know, the spacing between a 200 and a Q potency is, is variable depending upon the case. Um, in both um, in Northwestern Academy of Homeopathy and at Prometheus Homeopathic Institute, we use a lot of, of Q potencies, certainly not all 200 Cs. Um, I've, I use that more in veterinary prescribing than I do in human. It, it seems like it evens out, um, especially with our veterinary patients who are not as, their, their owners, most of them are not quite as good at reporting back on symptoms. It evens out that that response and then dip and then and catching when we need to redose and it, it keeps them you know the analogy i've heard is it's like we're getting them on the on the road with the c potency and the q potency helps in keeping the gas pedal depressed to the right level so it kind of like prolongs the effect and maybe it, lessens the aggravation kind of thing it, it, i'm not sure about lessening the aggravation especially in barren you know that was I don't think it lessened any aggravation there. And I have, you know, obviously seen some pretty, um, I've seen, not bad, but seen some aggravations with Q potencies. Um, but it seems, yes, it definitely seems like it prolongs the effect and it seems like it's a, there's an evening out. So as the effect of the C potency starts to wane, it, it feels like I, we don't get as much of a downward slope. Interesting. So it kind of prolongs the effect. You're, you're feeling huh? your... Um, second thing is I just have a comment. It's interesting when you mentioned about the history, the philosophical history of animals and, and their emotions, that Pythagoras said that he felt that animals did have emotions, whereas Descartes said no. Um, I know I've got different talks and stuff, and I know that uh, Pythagoras was well known for being a vegetarian. And uh, so in that sense, he kind of had a respect for animals. Um, I, I wonder if that played into why he had that, that view about animals. I don't know about Descartes. I don't know. It's so interesting. When I was when I was reading for this, I, I was going back and pulling out. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm in my attic pulling out, you know, books that I hadn't touched since many, many, many years ago. I was an undergraduate and then obviously reading, you know, new stuff as well. And I I don't know which was the chicken and the egg. I think they're, you know, reading about his philosophy and his writings, that fundamental thread of respect for all life and a recognition that that the divinity which we you know clearly see in people is expressed just as much in animals was was part of his teaching so i don't know whether that informed his vegetarianism or not but that's that's a great question and descartes is more known i think therefore i am it's almost more mm -hmm. of an actual exercise more of a almost more of an arrogance there more of a mm -hmm. look I figured out this problem i can think so yeah, um, so we're dominant. We can think. Animals can't think. Kind of thing. Right, which I don't agree with either. But, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> but that was certainly his viewpoint. Yes. Well, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have a question um, on the webinar by Dr. Uh, Archana. She's asking if you use essential oils with the animals for holistic care along with homeopathy. You know, I don't. Um, I'm not trained in that, and um, I know a lot of my clients um, are are interested, and you know, either work with someone who does sometimes, or um, read on their own. Um, but no, that that's not a part of my practice.
Just looking around the room, any other questions? Barb, any questions? Um, any questions from the webinar? Yeah, I have a comment. If, I don't know, can you hear me? Yes, I can. <laughs> oh, great. My, my name is uh, uh, I'm on a chiropractor in the home you have. And I have I a have real love of animals and I've been working with them for a while when I had that opportunity. And I had many, many cases where when I just looked at the emotional state, so I know how important it is. I my my first dog was is a lab named Cash who had the granulomas and I had no idea what to do with the symptom of the granulomas. Kept I figured out it was pulsatilla and the pulse went away. Those other things that I didn't even complain to about. And then I had Kitty that was failing with kidney failure who's um who ended up eating conium. And yeah. that was an really interesting case. Um to figure that one out, but I knew I know the cat's history and the owners, so I understood that the cat was 19 over three more years. So it's fabulous. It, 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 it was so it's, it's so much fun. It's so much fun to get this information, and I hope people don't. Uh oh, hello. Hello. Lost Dr. Francine. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Dr. Laura. I think oh. uh, we we probably lost uh, the connection with the school. Where oh, okay. You... Oh, sorry. No, no I no i i love hearing stories like that and i think you know i i actually think that as veterinarians um we have more to unlearn because than, than somebody who wasn't trained in in veterinary medicine because we are taught that we need to only look at the at the physical symptoms and and you know it's it's kind of a joke in vet school and afterwards that pet owners or pet parents want to come in and tell us all of this stuff, which is just useless. We call it that useless information. And, and it really holds the key to understanding that animal state. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. You know, Dr. Laura, this is your presentation was so wonderful. I, I enjoyed it so much. And I have uh, a, a dog. He's a mix labrador and australian shepherd and everything that you told me today is so true i mean i i look at i look at him the same way and you know it, it was like exactly what i thought and i'm so glad that you know i think the same way it's great i i'm so glad to hear that yeah it's i think it, what i want to do is is open i, I really want to have more dialogue and open up and give people you know permission i don't know if they need permission i don't know if that's the right word but encouragement to view our non-human animal companions whether they share our home or whether they're you know some of the coyotes and raccoons and eagles and you know raptors and other animals that i treat they're they're harder to read the emotions on but i think it's just a matter of practice it's a matter of getting to know those species and then getting to know them as individuals yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Well, um, I'm not sure. Just does how do I turn over screen sharing or take that off or what happens next? I think. Uh, let me see if I can um, connect with Doctor Fear to see what's going on there. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I think they lost their internet because I see um, Ashley as offline, and she uh, is she is with uh, at the at the school uh, gotcha. broadcasting. So I think uh, they might be trying to reconnect. So okay. um, just, just to you know, um, yeah, I think they are back on, and they're trying. Um, I. 
I was in California uh, till last year and then we moved to Florida and okay. the place where we are at, there is so much wildlife. Um, I was just, you know, used to my dog as the yeah. only animal and, you know, the uh, one week after we came here, uh, we uh -huh. had bears in our backyard and I completely freaked out. Um, because I would too. <laughs> yeah, the preserve is right behind uh, our neighborhood. And then we have coyotes and we have the somebody spotted and posted picture of the Florida uh, panther, which is so rare. And I'm like, wow. oh my God, are these animals here to welcome us? And you know, wow. are so common. Like we have, I think about five or six ponds in our, our community and there are gators in all of them. Uh, and then uh, we have, uh, oh, Dr. Fear just called me. Just a second, doctor. Okay, sure. Hey, Mishi. Yes, Dr. Fear. I think you got disconnected. Okay, so I think I'm going to go out of GoTo meeting and I'm going to go back in. Okay. I think, I think, so let's stay on the line and let's make sure we reconnect here. Okay. Yeah, she was talking and then boom, it was gone. Yes. I think it's a problem with our connection oh, or something. Yeah, so I was just chatting with uh, with Dr. Yeah. Laura and telling her how we have so many, uh, so much of wildlife around here. Oh, so she's still on? Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I think you will you will like it so much here. I'm pretty sure um, <clears throat> you have a lot of wildlife up there too. We have deers. Like deers are like there all all the time, every day. We have turkeys, beautiful turkeys, and we have the sandhill cranes. It's truly amazing. I love those. I love yeah. those cranes. Yeah. Trying to do a wired connection here to make it more stable. Still there, Misha? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Trying to connect to the uh, internet by uh, I have an Ethernet connection. Actually, uh, let's see. Well, for some reason, I can also hear you. No, Mishi, you you and I, I think are. The, the panelists and organizers are the ones that are keeping the whole thing on the on the thing on yes. this up yes, and so running. Good. Yes, yeah. so good. I was the organizer. Otherwise, we would have lost the whole thing. Yep. Yeah. And also, Dr. Jeff is. So I think that he he holds the main reins. <laughs> I'm connected by Ethernet. 
Can anyone else get online here? Because apparently the webinar is still going on, but just for some reason we're not going out. It says it says I'm connected by Ethernet, but I'm not getting out. Does that happen here sometimes? The, the... Can you get can you get anywhere else? Like, can you go and Google? Uh... Can you access anything other than the webinar via your Ethernet? Dr. Fear, doc, doc, uh, Dr. Laura is asking if you can access any other internet page, like Google or anything else other than the webinar? Yes. Are you able to access uh, any other internet page, like Google, using the, the Ethernet? I'm sorry. Are you able to access any other internet page like Google or any other website other than the webinar? No, no. no. I'm, I'm, I, I have it connected to Ethernet, and we have a couple other people here with computers, and they can't access the internet either. So I think we lost somehow. We lost our internet connection here. Yeah. On. The only other thing is if somebody has hotspot, you could try it that way. But yes, it will take their. It will use up their. No. It'll take your. It'll use your data off of yeah, your cell yeah, service. Yeah, but, but some, if somebody's generous maybe, enough, maybe yeah, we can use yeah. a phone as a yeah. hotspot. hotspot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you may not get really speedy. Uh, depends on your phone connection. You may not get really speedy um, visuals, but you can communicate. Or can you make your phone a hotspot? Can you make your phone a hotspot? Yes. Uh, Barb Milner's here. She's gonna use her. Is it like a more recent uh, Android, Android or something? Microwave movies in that glass bowl outside. Use uh, um, use the cell phone for connection. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, for some reason the internet here just died. Still nothing, still no online, still no net and UHS. What's what's the name of your phone? No, what's what's the name of your network? Yeah, but what how do I see it? What's, what's the name? network travel that prevents the enablement of your own hotspot. I don't know why that is. Let me see if my phone works. Here, I can do my phone. Let's see if that works. Maybe I have some feedback right now. I have. I can also I'm going to be using it through as well too. Uh, what's your? Um, it's Maribel. Which one? Oh yeah, that's your phone. And then the password is. Excellent. Thank you, Maribel. Good thing you showed up. Okay. Um, looks like we're online. Let me try and log back in. You're going to uh, maybe leave your phone up here just so we get a good connection. So we're, so we're done. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I'm logging back in now. Okay.
I mean, it seems like a lot more easier. More than my friend. <laughs> I mean, that's not a big part of that. A lot of things are not things like that. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. I'm glad you guys are back on. Gosh, that was that was interesting. Our internet just <laughs> died in the whole building, probably the whole campus. I don't know. We must have been struck by something, a meteor or something. Um, good time. Sandra did have a question for you. Oh, okay, uh, go ahead. I tentatively answered it, but but. Constitutional prescribing, but you know the acutes I treat are usually acutes that happen in those cases. So I I I more um, do acute prescribing for um, the wildlife center and for some of the farm animals that I work with, um, and then the dogs and cats and the pet chickens are more constitutional prescribing. Oh, thank you. I thought uh, I. I guess stromonium for kitty kitty because I thought, hmm, fear in the dark, maybe there's a fear of water. And cats are, you know, have a predisposition to, you know, kind of see something that may not be there. I mean, my cats do that all the time. <laughs> right. Yeah. Good, good <laughs> point. Yeah. This is Francine Burke again. Um, with the kitty on the stromonium, the only thing that I didn't see, I wondered if you noticed it, I didn't see any dilated pupils. Hmm. They, just, yeah, kitty, uh, kitty would absolutely do that. Um, they would show me videos of her at home and she would look, I mean, that was the part that they said, she looks like you've seen a ghost. Like the tail would puff, the body would get bigger, her pupils would dilate, you know, it was like every, nerve was on high alert in this animal. It was it was so interesting. So, Dr. Weiss, thank you so much for your excellent presentation. How about our round of applause for? Well, thank you all for listening. And as I said, I love I love talking about this. So it's it made me really happy to be here this morning. Oh, well, maybe we'll ask you to come back next year. This is really wonderful. We've really learned a lot. Um, okay. We're going to move on. Thank you again. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to move on to Dr. Joel Shepard is going to tell us about the summation of correct 
remedy qualities, single, simple, salutary, and uh, take it away. The sigma. Last one, very last. The sigma. Oh, there it is. Okay. Joel, only you would merge uh, calculus with homeopathy. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, on the webinar, yes. Okay, good, thanks. All right. I'll just go into presentation mode here. So you just have to hit the forward and back. You still see the oh. screen, let me see. Yeah, I'm, I see the screen, uh, but here's something. Um, I think Dr. Susan Beale uh, typed something in the chat box and it just popped up. Um, but it, it, it's pretty three sentences long. I don't know if Dr. Laura is still there to discuss it or should we keep it uh, for later? I don't know. I have a question for you first. What do you see on the screen? Do you just see the first slide or you see the, the two slides? Oh, um, what do you see on the screen? I just see uh, the summation of correct remedy qualities. That slide. Just and that slide, I, okay. Uh, oh, and I also see law of similars, which is in a different column. Okay, here, let me, uh, I'm gonna try and, Okay, now you should see just one. Yeah, just one. Now I see the big one. Yeah. Forward and back. But do do we want to do the question? Um, Dr. Shepard, I'll leave it up to you. Do you want to do the There's no need. There's no need to do the question. It was more of a remedy discussion thing. It's okay. fine. No, we could do that too for a couple of seconds. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. The the only point that I was gonna <clears throat> was gonna make was two things. One is in, in answer to the acute versus quote constitutional prescribing, we see a lot of errors when people prescribe for animals and they just prescribe for the acute exacerbation of the chronic um, disease um, and, and forget that there's an underlying chronic disease. So that's a pretty common error. And then the only other comment I was gonna make about this stromonium case is one of the one of the remedies that we need to think about in those stromonium type presentations or presentations where people jump to stromonium quickly not 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 that flora did jump quickly but mercurius is also a remedy that we see a lot of those common symptoms and and it's also a really common remedy in prescribing for animals and it tends to get missed with some of the violent symptoms and 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 that that sort of thing and sometimes looking at the causation if if we can go back and look at the causation sometimes that will give you an ability to differentiate you know the the stromonium versus the belladonna versus the the mercurius presentations of that sort of uh, violent type type things but when you're like mercurius what would you need drooling or like heavy salivation? Susan, she, uh, Cassandra saying, wouldn't you need drooling or heavy salivation to, to I, like I, I, different ammonia? We, we sometimes see that, but not always. There's a lot of mercurious cases that in animals that we don't necessarily see the salivation to the degree that that you might expect. Um, and uh, sometimes we'll see something more subtle, like an ocular discharge that might be corrosive. Uh, sometimes we'll see a leucorrhea or a or a discharge at the prepuce, um, that that sort of thing. But we don't need to necessarily have that really big sloppy mouth that 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 people think. We also sometimes will see the 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 
the flaccid tongue, the teeth indentations and that sort of thing on the on the tongue if if you can if you can be observant, but that also doesn't need to be part of it. What One of the, the other what about the nighttime aggravation that we'd expect with Mercurius? Uh, yeah, I often I often will see that. Sometimes sometimes you have to not push the client, but sometimes you have to 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 push for that that modality. One of the other reasons that we need to think about Mercurius a lot in in animal stuff is um, also just because of the the environmental ecological exposure to it. You know, not only through the through the vaccines that animals receive at higher rates than humans tend to receive, but also because it's a common contaminant in a lot of the pet foods, particularly the fish fish based pet foods. Um, and so there there may be some sort of underlying mercury toxicity in a lot of the presentations that we see in these animals. And and that can sometimes be a rewarding uh, rabbit hole to to go down when you've got cases. Susan, excellent comments. I really appreciate those. Anything else? For the now I want to. I really want to do like math and and uh, math and homeopathy together. That's ah. just a really <laughs> slick slide. Uh, well, get out your calculator. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the symbol sigma here is serving a double purpose. It also can be translated to the letter S, and uh, as well as the mathematical uh, use of sigma as sum or sum total. So we have the sum total of correct remedy qualities, what we're going to talk about today. And those are the, the, the qualities or the descriptors of a correct remedy that Hahnemann lists in the organon. We'll go through them one by one. So, of course, the unifying principle of homeopathy is similars, law of similars, and medicinal substances initiate the curing process when this rule is applied. But in addition to similars, law of similars, the organon mentions several more essential qualities of medicines that are required for the correct remedy to work in actual practice. So, the first one we'll consider is single. The single remedy it is impossible to predict how two or more medicines might hinder or alter each other's action upon the human body. These are uh, kind of uh, quotes, not the exact wording from the aphorisms that are listed after the statement. So each single substance has a singular action. Each substance is different than any other substance. There could be no equivalents, no surrogates word that Hahnemann uses in paragraph 119. In provings, we have to investigate each uh, medicine to single out one medicine, Hahnemann's language. And he goes on to say compound prescriptions, and there's the German phrase for that translation. In modern times, we would call it polypharmacy, perhaps, would obtain results that no human being, but only a god, could decipher. He's talking about complications, complexities interactions and no one can predict what would happen from the multiple forces converging on an unknown object in Hahnemann's language. So why do we have so many combination homeopathic remedies? Even of course in allopathy there's polypharmacy all the time. So the justification that you can read from some of the pharmaceutical companies that put out combination remedies go something like this. Uh, they say that the vital force, the life energy, chooses what is needed from the multiple medicines. Now, Hahnemann's definition of vital force is that it's unreasoning and purely extinct, instinctual, it's automatic. And the dynamis cannot make decisions, it cannot change its mind or pick or choose as if it had an intellect. So then Hahnemann is saying it's just automatic, instinctual. Uh, so the combination remedy people say that the vital force does have reasoning, that it can choose what it needs from the combination. Okay, so it has a different, different, uh, different definition of the vital force. Now in allopathic or conventional medicine, it's based on reductionism, where every abnormal organ or every abnormal 
chemical pathway or physiological problem needs its own medicine. Right? This is an unstated assumption of that the parts, each part needs its own treatment. Of course, this assumes that the body is not a unified whole, that if you have a problem in one organ, like the heart, the rest of the body doesn't know about it, or doesn't react to it, or doesn't respond. So this is a different assumption in homeopathy, of the, the assumption of wholeness rather than, than the assumption of reductionism. So instead, homeopaths tend to say a disease is not an entity or a material thing separate from its living totality. Disease is a distunement of the living whole, paragraph 13. Now, when we're talking about the word single in the organon, Hahnemann never says that we only need a single dose to cure chronic disease. That's nowhere in the organon. So the single is our goal, our golden uh, aim in prescribing in homeopathy. Now, originally, we were going to have questions and answers here. So when we come to the end of one descriptor here, we could pause. And if anyone wants to make a comment or a question, we can do that. Anyone? Yeah, well, so we all know that uh, he wants us to use single remedies. But when I was studying homeopathy in the class, I was very surprised to see that if you go online, there are some companies that not only had com combination of remedies, but they were selling cords. Like a chord on a piano has multiple notes. Like you could buy like a remedy like arsenicum, and in the same dose, there's like 6C and 12C and 30C and you know blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like that wouldn't be a good idea either. But does anybody have any experience with prescribing or using those? Would they interact with each other? Would they do something? Well, you can think of a sine wave, and if you have a second sine wave, even if it's harmonic, is it going to add, subtract, or interfere? All those are possibilities. You think of remedies as waves, or wavelengths, or frequencies, rather than a chemical thing. So um, let's say one of those wavelengths, one of those harmonics, are accurate and help the person. What do you do next? Right? You don't learn when you have fixed combinations, whether they're harmonic or just multiple remedies. Right? Which remedy worked? which potency worked, you don't know. What do you do when it stops working? So the knowledge base of remedies is not extended and your own personal ability to prescribe is not advanced. Because we do see that those things have an effect and we don't know exactly what's going on. You know, one example, I was throwing a rock into the water. And if I throw a second rock into the water, the ripples don't cancel each other out usually. So you have two sets of ripples. So if you have several ripples or waves, then one of them might be the right one for the for the person. And they don't necessarily interfere with each other all the time. Okay, anything else about single? Yeah, um, you mentioned polypharmacy. I mean, if especially for practitioners who have you know, see patients who are taking a lot of allopathic medicine, polypharmacy is, I mean, the average American takes, you know, they can give you a number of drugs, four or five drugs, whatever. Uh, if they're older, I mean, it's almost guaranteed they're on a lot of medication. Sometimes I found in those patients, it's useful to use, not at the same time, two different remedies, but like one remedy for one situation and something else pops up, maybe a side effect of a drug or something, something else. And then they have osteoporosis, so you might have to give a, a remedy for that. You want to comment on that? So, uh, paragraph 40 in the organon says when you have dissimilar diseases, you can alternate remedies. Right, it's right there when Hahnemann says it. So, we have dissimilar diseases, especially in people in polypharmacy, you have the disease of the medicine, the medicinal disease. You have the disease that's acute, perhaps like COVID or flu A, and you have the chronic. So, what do you do? What are you prescribing for? So it depends what's most prominent or most disturbing or what's newest. Do you prescribe the remedy at that moment that seems to be the best for what they need at that moment? But if they have multiple problems, you can alternate remedies according to which pro problem is worse at that moment. 
So it takes some education of the patient if they're going to do it on their own. Right? Which remedy do they need right now? Maybe it's a little bit more obvious. We talk about like someone in a coma. So you give them one remedy when they're unconscious, like opium. Then they start waking up and they have a new set of symptoms. Maybe five minutes later, you give another remedy. Maybe five minutes later, they're changed again. So each disease has its own timing. And so some prescriptions we can give uh, some remedy and wait a month. Or yesterday, I had some asthmatic kids. You know, I'm only going to wait about 20 minutes to see if the remedy is right and maybe prescribe something else. If they have multiple problems, then, you, uh, you know, you just hopefully tell the patient or the guardian that whichever is bothering them the most, give the remedy for that now. Most patients don't uh, easily do that, so then you estimate a schedule. Okay. Tell them, all right, in the morning you take the remedy for antidoting your allopathic drug in the evening, you try your constitutional remedy. You, you have to take the case and then try to help them to take the remedy they need at a given time during the day. Maybe we can talk more about polypharmacy. You know, when they test allopathic medicines, right, double blind, how many times have you seen a study where there's more than two drugs in the study? There are no studies for, for polypharmacy and they're double blind you know, in the gold standard type of test in regular medicine, because the, you know, you don't know what the outcome, the endpoint is from, which of the drugs. Now, occasionally they have, you know, two, like a, you know, for hypertension, you put two medicines together and maybe have a double blind or a double crossover, right? But that's about the maximum. There's no tests for eight medicines, like if you're on a statin and a blood thinner and a, and in a diuretic and an AC inhibitor, there's no double blind study for four drugs. Even. So polypharmacy then is not scientific, even with their own standards. I saw a study in, uh, in on JAMA, a letter to the editor a few years back, that um, they looked at major impact journals and they looked at studies of drugs and they found that like 90% of the drug studies were on a single drug in an individual, no other drugs, no other medical conditions, no other comorbidities. And then they looked at the Medicare population, most of these drugs are used, and 90% of people are on multiple drugs and have multiple comorbidities. So they concluded that, you know, yeah, basically 90% of the research doesn't correspond to 90% of the people that need it. So like you said, not scientific at all. Not scientific. They would go further, right? What did we learn about reading the vaccination studies? Placebo, but they don't use placebos. They've never used a placebo in a vaccine study. They use either another vaccine or a, um, an, an adjuvant, which oftentimes is what has most of the side effects. That way they can say the, uh, the test experimental group is not different in terms of side effects to the uh, control group, which is not placebo. And that way they can hide the side effects. Yeah. yeah. Another way they manipulated uh, with antidepressants. People read that literature, the SSRIs. They eliminate the placebo responders. Right? So you don't even have a baseline of what, what the, the nothing drug does to the, the real drug. So for years, they had statistics that showed that, the, that it worked for minimal or moderate depression, but it doesn't. It's about the same as placebo. Another question, Dr. Shepard. Have you ever seen, or maybe a comment, have the perspective on this, like remedies working together scientifically? So Hahnemann experimented with two at the same time because his uh, one of his son-in-laws was big on that, and he concluded it was two uh, that it would do something. But how in the world do you interpret it? I have a few clients where certain remedies will only work if there's like a remedy in the formulation. So do we have the complexity in modern times, yeah. whether it's the environmental toxins or previous medications, but uh, if you're thinking strictly or, you know, organ on Hahnemann, you're alternating remedies. Yeah. One for that condition, one for another condition. 
Excuse me, Dr. Shepard, I have um, um, a question. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, in your previous slide, you mentioned that uh, <clears throat> the um, do we or do, is there a remedy for each organ if that organ is disease? So, do you think um, we sh is there a concept called as organ remedies? Or yes, yes, there is Rademacher. It's actually was the guy who uh, introduced genus epidemicus to the homeopathic literature. He did organ therapy. It still exists. Some of some of the Materia Medica, depending which author you read, like Borky, has information from organ uh, Materia Medica. Yes, that is exactly what I'm holding in my hand, and I was looking at at Cardus Marianus and Natrum Sulf, and they both say they are liver remedies. So it's okay to prescribe those remedies if we find those dominant symptoms involving liver and other symptoms they're more useful if the pathology is so uh, extreme or intense for an organ that they throw off lots of symptoms and then it's easier to prescribe with that type of thinking okay. oftentimes oftentimes in our chronic disease we have symptoms all over the body all over the place even if it's a liver cancer and we can't you don't don't go automatically to the liver remedies of course nat salt is also a self salt so we have literature on how it's prescribed in the cell salt method, or it's most more physiological in the old sense. So you have to know the history of where those remedy informations come from. Can you please repeat the name of the author you mentioned? Rademacher, R-A-D-E-M-A-C-H-E-R. -E -E okay, thank you. Okay. I had a question. You know, so many times you hear that Sometimes you have to give an intracurrent remedy, reaction of what you what you've chosen as a constitutional remedy to go forward. But a lot of times it's a no seven. So how if you have a remedy that you think would work and it kind of works and it kind of stalls, so like something like tuberculinum, where there's a history of tuberculosis in the family. So there's two different theories there. there added on to the homeopathic law of similars. So you're taking other sciences and applying them to homeopathy in a theoretical way. So the idea that intercurrent just means you need another remedy. And the no-sodes as remedies, the provings are, are not very consistent, right? Because what does the no-sode come from? So if one person with tuberculosis doesn't have the same symptoms as another person with tuberculosis. So you have to know the source and the proving of that remedy and make sure the, the tuberculinum that you have, for instance, matches the source for that information. For instance, in our office, we have carcinosin. We have more than one type of carcinosin. Mm -hmm. And then, but one of our carcinosins matches what uh, Roger Morrison describes in his book. On, on carcinosin, so the, the one carcinosin in our office and his description works together. But our other carcinosin, we don't have good information on. So right, every person has a different cancer, or you know, different cancer of the breast, even is different for every person. So be careful with no sodes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I was going to mention that you sell. What what is a time frame? Nothing interferes with it, it can go on and on and on. And that's why in the old days they could one dose and wait forever. But now how many things interfere with our homeopathy? How many interfering waves or frequencies? Every minute, you know, who knows what, you know, the cell phone is interfering with something, I mean, or this this radiation from this, microwaves, whatever, the environmental toxins. We have so many interferences with remedies that the timing can only be judged clinically. 
Now, some diseases have their own inherent pace, like malaria, right? every second day, every third day. Mm -hmm. But even in modern times, those things are disrupted, whether it's from the treatment or just all the interferences in, uh, in our lifestyle. We can't even use that old materia medica for periodicity anymore. Mm -hmm. So flu, you know, if you don't give the right remedy, you'll know in 24 hours, approximately asthma, you know, in a few minutes, you know, hypertension, weeks and weeks and weeks. All right, so in the old books, you know, that said, there's a, a, uh, an author that says, remedy, 30 days, it'll work. Can't use that at all. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that was all just one quality here. We'll go on to another one. Simple. Oh. So there we have a problem with culture and language. So Hahnemann says, a true materia medica is a collection of the genuine, pure, unmistakable modes of action of a simple medicinal substance. Each medicine must be taken in a simple, natural, and that's the German word we translate to natural, form. So what does simple mean in Hahnemann's terms? Simple doesn't mean a, a reduced chemical entity, one single chemical. Simple to Hahnemann is what nature provides what you can find in nature, the whole plant, the whole natural mineral. It's exactly opposite to the way we use the word simple in modern American language. So for instance, and he specifically says this, alkaloids like quinine or morphine or strychnine are not simple in Hahnemann's terminology, even though that in modern times we call them a single chemical and therefore think of it as simple. So he goes on to list mainly minerals, you can read it for yourself in paragraph 273a, what he considers simple and not simple. Because you know, remember he was an expert chemist, so he put together lots of mineral substances like uh, hepar salt and causticum or soluble mercury, all those things were originated from him or making colloidal gold for the first time, it's kind of started colloidal chemistry. All those things go to uh, he divides and tells you what he considers simple when he considers not natural. So then he says, in no case is it necessary to give more than a single simple proved medicinal substance at one time. Right now, time right could be five minutes, time could be five days, five months. Okay. All right. Oh, any comments on simple? Here's simple, here's a modern physicist who compares simple to beauty. So what nature makes beautiful. I know there, I just wrote an article recently on mercuries um, based on an old article. And certain remedies, it seems like they're different, but they're really like mercurius vivus and mercurius solubus. They're, the mercurius solubus is the form of mercury that uh, Hahnemann devised, actually even before he was a homeopathy way to use mercury in a more soluble way. And then Merc virus is from the, you know, from a thermometer, just the active mercury, the silver stuff. Right. But in clinically, we use them the same. We use them interchangeably. I know there's other remedies like that too. Uh, and I think Hahnemann, at first, he used the Merc Sol more, and then toward the end, he was recommending more of the Merc virus. So I don't know the history of why, but before Hahnemann, they didn't use mercury. And how do you make mercury in small substances? How do you make it soluble? So he figured out how to do it and what came after that, why it was just as good, I don't know. Yeah, at first he favored the salt and then mm -hmm. he Now I'm thinking of other remedies like coffee, uh, toaster and coffee cruda. I mean, they're interchangeable. Uh, even tarantula, tarantula hispanica and tarantula cubensis. Um, well, that's true. Tarantula cubensis later. is a, yeah. something that washed ashore from Cuba, you know, right. tarantula. Right. But supposedly the people have used one and then use the other interchangeably. That's right. So we, we have a lot of similar remedies uh, that different provers or different doctors have taken from different sources and can overlap. Cannabis is another one. What's the difference between cannabis indicus and cannabis sativa in modern times? We don't see much difference. So but the idea of the chemistry, that Hahnemann was an expert chemist, right? Now he devised, for instance, we can talk about him a little bit, um, 
for the first time in history, a way to distinguish adulterated wine, wine adulter uh, adulterated with lead because it made it sweet. The Romans drank a lot of that sweet lead uh, spiked uh, liquors because it's sweet. So that was considered toxic even back then. So Hahnemann figured out how to distinguish the precipitant of lead from iron, which is normal in, in the grapes. So he used heparin sulfur, acidified sulfur, to distinguish between it. That's Hahnemann. Also, another chemist besides the colloidal chemistry that he invented, he did uh, arsenic poisoning. Detecting arsenic poisoning was used up until the 20th century, his method. So he was considered one of the top five chemists in Europe during his lifetime. Very simple. All right, next descriptor, salutary. All right. So the German word here is Heilsam. You know, you can see there the word Heil, we'll come back to that. So he uses that word in paragraph 119, 191, the internally given medicine is directed at the whole, which is fittingly homeopathic, and that will cause a salutary alteration, meaning a healing or wholesome, or and I'm in this case, because I'm sticking with my sigma, so here we're going to use the word salutary. Or he uses the same word, heilsam, in the, another paragraph, the homeopathic specific and salutary medicine is used internally and again the highly dynamized medicines are the most salutary so salutary so we have that uh, root of the word there heil and you look that up in German dictionaries it can mean hail or heal or cure or salutary or to make whole so the title of course of his book his textbook Heilkunst you know Organon der Heilkunst so we have Heil and Kunst. Heil, now we've already got that definition, but what is Kunst? Kunst means art. However, the modern use of the word art is different than the original definition. If you look in a big dictionary, the first definition of art is a mastery of a skill or craft through experience, not do whatever you please in it, in the name of creativity. So what does this mean? If you say you're an artist, gifted artist, you still have to learn the tools of your trade, of your craft. You have to learn which brush to use, natural bristles, unnatural bristles, wide, narrow. You have to learn what type of pigments. You want to use oils, you want to use watercolor, you want to use a pencil, charcoal, and you have to learn when you're applying it to canvas, to paper, vellum, parchment, or to a wall. Don't learn, no matter how gifted you are, to do these things. In a, uh, in a masterly way until you experience it, until you'll actually do it. So this is the real meaning of the word art. Okay, why are we going into this? So we can therefore look at the title of Hahnemann's book, which doesn't say homeopathy. It says Organon der Heilkunst. And we could then with these definitions say, or translated or transliterated as an instrument for learning the salutary skill not medicine, or not even the healing art, unless you have this idea of what art meant to Hahnemann. Okay. So what is being salutary? What is health? Hahnemann uses the word harmony often. Right? He says that the life force continues our life on a harmonious course if the organism is healthy but the organism cannot or does not cure itself in some diseases, otherwise we would not get sick. This is part of his phrasing that the vital force is not intelligent or rational or thinking, that it just reacts automatically. The curative medicine reestablishes health and life's harmony, there's the German phrase, only through dynamic action on the life principle. And we're going into what salutary means to Hahnemann. All parts in the organism are harmonious in health due to the vital force. Health is a dynamic, not a fixed state. It's not homeostasis, but a co coherent variability. It's another word you could use is health is homeodynamic. All right. Any questions about Heil or Heilsam or salutary? 
Okay, we'll go on. Oh. You want to mention the difference between vital force and homeopathy versus the beast? And the... I wasn't going to. <laughs> that would be another lecture. <laughs> so uh, there's a naturopathic organization who are vitalists. They tend to use vitalism rather than the word bees. So vitalism is the big, just a summary, vitalism is the big phrase. Right? And then in history, vitalism has had different words used to describe that healing force in people. So these medicatrice naturae is what uh, come down to the modern nat uh, nat naturopath, excuse me. Hahnemann, which Dr. Fjord found for me, Hahnemann uses that phrase in the third edition of the Organon. And uh, in later editions, he changes the language. He doesn't use that phrase anymore. However, he, he didn't want to use that phrase for vital force because of baggage. What is the baggage? That, they, that uh, the nature healers want to imitate nature. And Hahnemann found that that would often make things worse rather than better. So I take an example, an extreme example. Let's say you've got cholera. So your body healing force is trying to get rid of all those toxins and bacteria in your gut. So you're spewing out diarrhea until you lose all your electrolytes and liquids. So if you're going to imitate nature, you're going to give something to help the body have more diarrhea. That won't work. So back in Hahnemann's days, he was mainly working with these very uh, strong, acute illnesses, what you might call infectious illnesses now. And that if you tried to imitate nature, take away the bad humors, the bad fluids from the body, it would often weaken the person so much that they could not recover. All right, hundreds of years, nature doctors considered four bad humors, blood, phlegm, bile, and black bile. And that the way to help a person was to get rid of one or more of these bad fluids by getting them out of their body. So bleeding, being a puncture, bleeding people was hundreds and hundreds of years. Why did it last so long? Because it works at first. So if you've got a big high fever, right? Remember, they're, they're mainly treating acute diseases, infectious diseases, serious ones. You've got a high fever, you're in pain, and uh, everything aches. If you take the blood out, it relaxes the person and their fever goes down. Why? Because the body is losing, you know, all the things that allow the immune response. So the body can't respond if you take away the blood. However, if the person isn't really strong, then they get sick again. You take away more blood and they get weaker and weaker and weaker. And of course, historically, when I taught this course, I used George Washington's death as the example. So, uh, so the, the nature doctors criticize the Dr. Benjamin Rush type doctors, the allopaths, for bleeding George Washington to death. But that was the accepted method, get rid of the bad fluids. Okay, so Hahnemann then criticizes the bees because of the way they use the bees as the reason to imitate nature. Okay. Now, modern nap, uh, nature paths, not quite the same, right? Lin Lahar, one of the founding co-father, you know, one of the grandfathers, he actually died before the, this institution was built, the original one. But anyway, he talks about the vital force as the wisdom of the universe in our individual body. So his definition of the vital force has more to do with metaphysical or spiritual or religious beliefs in the in the creator as a universal mind. And part of that is within each person. So we have a problem with language and a problem with culture. Hahnemann is not using the term vital force, the salutary force in terms of religion or in terms of metaphysics, which is gonna come up next. All right, I don't think that maybe was clear enough. I'm working on that paper. I haven't, <laughs> so I'll have to present it in more exact detail and exact language. Or I finally I think the big difference is that these, because it's a bigger thing, it, you said it's kind of more could be there, there's an intelligence there, whereas the vital force is a subset which isn't necessarily intelligent. That's right. It just does what it does, and it's not you happen. That's right. So 
the, the vital force is more like prana or chi or ki, or in the Bible, if there's the breath of life, which is different than the soul and the spirit. So there is a different differentiation. All right. Oh, the next quality is small, smallness or smallest. So it doesn't only depend on the accurate similarity, but it depends on the size of the medicine. And Hahnemann uses the word Kleinheit, which means smallness of the dose. And he says, use the appropriate degree of smallness for the best cure. The smallest dose of medicine dynamized with so little material that its smallness cannot be grasped. This was before Avogadro's number. So now we know statistically, or he realized uh, as, as being an expert chemist that he was, he was potentizing remedies where there's probably no chemistry left. That's what he's implying, I think, in this paragraph. In homeopathy, the smallest doses are used. He says that many times. And, uh, and we know that the smallest, these small doses don't follow the usual high school chemistry rules. Okay. Now, he doesn't use the word minimum. He doesn't word, use the word infinitesimal. These are authors after Hahnemann. And he also says there's no limit to how small the remedy can be. So actually, how, how many hours after MM potencies are we up to in some remedies? 190 hours of, of uh, potentizing beyond the MM potency. It's interesting that the one patient I'm using on the Oma patient, she uh, reacts with a, 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 an even number, like 192 will last for a week or two helps her energy and then stops working. And then when she goes to the odd one next, 193, it works for usually two to three weeks. So it works a little longer. The odd ones for longer than the even ones. No idea why. <laughs> Anyone can explain it. Is she an odd patient? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Okay. Well, it's just, yeah. so it's <laughs> mainstream. <laughs> so why do the French use nine and 15? And in this country, we use six and 12. We had Dr. Rancia gave a talk once where he went through mm -hmm. the different, where they would look at seedlings and they would give different potencies and they would gradually go up. And yeah. you could see there was a time slip curve of the growth. And he even commented on it and said, Oh, you guys used the 30C and 200C. Those were peaks. Those were like maximum activity levels. So the potencies that we just routinely use, how do we come up with those? Because by experience, I think yeah. people found that those were the active nodes. You know, if you go from a 30C to a 32C, you're not going to see much difference. If you go from a 30 to a 200, yeah. you will. So there's lots of unknowns still exactly what is in those remedies. I think that holds homeopathy back more than the law similars. Glenn and I wrote a paper a couple of years ago, quite a few years ago now, talking about that whole business of ascending potencies and how come the 200 sometimes got called the devil's potency when we were giving it in, a, in ascending amounts rather than just, you know, opening a case with the 200. Then, and what we found is when we started looking at logarithmic scales that that when you looked at the the chords of ascension the 200th overshot the mark and and so sort of the sweet part spot for ascending uh seems to be the the 135th which is 135th or, or a little bit less and I'll, I'll send you that paper just for kicks if you want yeah very good will help us. Uh, by the way, if anyone that wasn't exposed to what a Q potency is, uh, in the fifth edition, uh, Hahnemann uses the term 50th millesimal, uh, a different way of preparing it uh, compared to the earlier editions of the organon ones. He was lived in Paris. In the fifth or sixth edition? Sixth edition. Oh, excuse me. Sixth edition, 50th millesimal. So in German, the, the word for 50th millesimal starts with a Q. So the Germans call them Q potencies. And whereas in English, for some weird reason, we call them LMs, which makes no sense with Roman, Roman numerals because M is a thousand and L is minus 50 because the L is before the M. So it doesn't, you know, if you use Roman numeral look, nomenclature, it doesn't come out 50,000 or 50th millesimal. But so the Q makes more sense. Uh, quin, quin, I can't even say it, whatever the word for. 50,000 S in German starts with a Q. You want to mention the nanopharmacology aspects? Go ahead. Nanopharmacology? Oh, nano. 
No, I wasn't going to mention that. You can <laughs> give your talk on that. So to me, the you know, if we have 190 hours beyond the MM, and you just make it by flux, just by liquid flux, right? Do you, yeah, th do you still think there's nanoparticles in there? Um, maybe, but it's interesting that I think when you get into the higher potencies, the the higher dilutions and potencies, because uh, not just the dilution process. Actually, there's studies and you just dilute without succussion, parameters become inactive. You need that potentization, adding friction to the system. Right. And so there's nanoparticles, so maybe to a certain extent, but then what happens is you start forming silicon nanoparticles, so you're doing it in glass, and also water nanostructures right. that are probably probably the active ingredients of probably water nanostructures. That's right. That's what uh, Luke Montagnier, he had this whole thing about sending a signal and receiving a signal over the internet and of a remedy, and then that would you know, have an effect. You could see the signal, uh, and he said it was based on just water nanostructures. Yes. That's right. So uh, you could say a liquid crystal or some some such structure has to be there, not just a particle. You know, if it's a mineral, it makes sense. You know, you had silica, 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 silica down to a nanoparticle. What, what is a nanoparticle of lycopodium? Right. Which part of the plant is it? And is it always the same part of the plant? Is well, it a cell? Is it an RNA? Is it DNA? What is it? Literally in plants, there are hundreds of different chemicals and compounds. Right. And, yeah. So some that we have names for, some that we don't. Right. So, so a, a nanoparticle of all, each and every one of those whole substances is a nanoparticle of each of those components there. So that to me, the nanoparticle is not the final word, but we should talk about it. So we've got smallest, subtle. All right. So what is the German word for subtle? Feynman. So, uh, what does Hahnemann mean by subtle? So, what are some of the synonyms in modern English that might clarify the word subtle? Take your pick. Or here's an artistic expression of subtle white. It's put up there just so if anyone wanted to ask questions. So Hahnemann includes that it's finely divided, you know, finum, finely divided, subtle, so finely divided that it's not chemistry, not material. All right, now we come to one even more controversial, spirit-like. You can see the German word for that in paragraph nine at the end of the first sentence here. So Hahnemann goes to lengths to describe what he means by that word, spirit-like in German, in paragraph 11a especially and he compares it to magnetism, electricity, and gravity, forces of physics, not something metaphysical or magic or religious. And he uses the examples of the moon and the tides and mag magnets and so on. And he says these, the connection between cause and effect is not directly perceivable to our senses. So, and these forces are non-material, but not metaphysical. So also Hahnemann uses that word that we translate as spirit-like and dynamic interchangeably as synonyms. So he's, the word spirit-like has to do with physics, whether we're talking electricity, magnetism, uh, friction, thermodynamics, whichever those words you want to use, not a force of the mind and not a force of magic. Now Hahnemann uses that same term for a disease. Diseases are also spirit-like. Again, you have to let go of the religious usage of that word. When ill, the spirit-like vital force distunes or mistunes through the dynamic influence of the morbific agent. So he's saying that the so-called etiology, the cause of a disease is its energy, not its material. So I'm gonna visualize it with infectious diseases. It's not the structure of the streptococcus bacteria, it's the energy that interacts with the energy or vital force or the spirit-like healing ability of the body. Okay. So let's take that as a further example. 
how many bacteria have to land on you before you get sick? Five, 50, 500. It's not a quantitative thing, it's qualitative. It has to do with your immune system, it has to do with the environment's transmissibility. It has to do then with the energy. And Hahnemann says that you instantly become distuned if you're susceptible from the exposure to the morbific agent, in this case, the strep. So what does regular medicine do? You go to, you take your child to the pediatrician, they do a throat swab and come back and say, he's got strep throat. Well, that's not the disease. Streptococcus is a living organism, not a disease. It has its own things to do in life. It's only a disease if it's in a living person who's susceptible and has symptom, symptoms. Some people get strep and die the next day. Some people are terriers. Some people are never diagnosed and never bothers them. So it's a, in regular medicine, they take one part of the whole disease and make it the whole disease. They take the pathology or the infectious agent or the abnormal physiology as if that's the whole disease rather than just a consequence of the dynamic imbalance. Okay. So now medicines are not alive. They don't have a vital force, but they do have an energy. So that word spirit-like or dynamis can be used instead of vital force or life force to describe the, uh, the medicinal energy. And by dynamizing or potentizing, it, really, it makes this spiritual energy, energy available or increased or more. Okay. So medicines act dynamically or in a spirit-like manner on the organism. So, so don't get caught up on the modern use of the word spirit as if it means the soul or something, as they say in religion. So there is a different wor word in German for the religious soul or spirit. And it's, uh, you can see it's written differently, geistlich, right? Rather than the word Hahnemann uses in the organ. Another German word, geistlich, means spiritual, moral, or intellectual meaning. So the Hahnemann's word means non-material and does not imply anything in religion. However, Hahnemann did believe in the creator. So we're not going to ignore that. And the next slide, we'll get some quotes of how he talks about the creator. Essentially, he says, why are things set up the way they are? Why do people get sick? Why has, um, has the law of similars been provided to us as a way of curing with medicinal substances? So those are questions of philosophy, not a question of a practical experience nature. But it comes from somewhere. And this is his a system of, of on how he looks at reality and nature and life with the, with the creator who put it all together. The third point is especially involved is especially uh, still appropriate, right? Appropriate in this <laughs> last two years. Yeah. So I don't know. We just had fourth year medical students from Loyola. If we said something like that. They would stop listening. <laughs> By time, they're so, what is the modern word these days in politics? Indoctrinated, right? They have a worldview that's so solidified that you can't change it. By time, they're in the fourth year. That's why Dr. Fiore and I and Dr. Sonori and other doctors here teach nature paths. We tried, how many years did we try? with the allopathic medical schools, 10, 12 years, 30, <laughs> 30 years. Right. So to us, the future of homeopathy is with the nature pass. Because their philosophy is more, when we say, you know, conventional medicine, it's what is the basis? Pathology. What is pathology? You cut something out of someone, you kill it, you stain it, and you look at it under the microscope, you're looking at that. How can you find out anything about life in the living Kind of a exercise in futility, whereas in vitalistic medicine, you're, you know, you're looking at the vitalism, you're looking at the person, 
in the totality rather than just Perfect. But it's so pervasive of a, of a way of thinking. I think that would be the nature path. You have what the green allopaths you call them. Green allopaths, right? They've taken the ideas, the worldview uh, about um, medicine and health and brought it into naturopathy instead of the nature cure point of view. All right. Oh, this was the screen for when we're going to ask questions, trying to show spirit like in an energy form. You know, when I was doing research for that word in paragraph nine, you know, where he introduces the vital force, I came across a, uh, on Google, it was a student at the Connecticut Naturopathic School, the one that's discontinued now. What was it? Bridgeport. So he, he went to Bridgeport as a naturopathic student, and as soon as they read paragraph nine in the Organon, he decided that naturopathy was a cult, and he, and he quit naturopathic school. So you have to be really careful about the language. And the, the spirit-like, as it's all translated in all the modern English versions of the Organon, does not have anything to do with religion. Unfortunately, Kant kind of, Kant was a Swedenborgian, and a lot of people look to Kant, and he kind of melded some of the Swedenborgian spiritual beliefs that the mental symptoms were most important, uh, and it kind of distorted, kind of distorted homeopathy. Hahnemann wasn't like that, but Kant did, and a lot of people still look to Kant. Right. And then, uh, that's kind of a distortion of homeopathy, uh, right. addition of something that kind of doesn't. That's right, the personal. Good personal religious beliefs were introduced into homeopathy. So, you know, when you read uh, Kent, he, he talks about the, the religious aspect as a universal mind rather than a spirit. So therefore, the mental symptoms are always most important to Kent because that's closest to the higher creator. So this is a, a religious belief that Hahnemann did not introduce into homeopathy. When you do, what are the important symptoms? We talked about, uh, uh, Dr. Weiss talked about the uh, mental symptoms. They always are part of the case, right? When Hahnemann was writing before there was psychology, so we had to say that there was a whole person, mind and body, you need all the symptoms to prescribe correctly. But he didn't say that the mental symptoms were always the characteristic symptoms. Just as you have to have them with every case, but then you decide what are the characteristics symptoms, not always mental. And that's a paper I just wrote. I didn't send it in yet. So the difference there in German, we have the word characteristic symptoms, right? You make a totality first, then from the totality you have to decide the, the, the important symptoms, the significant symptoms. Hahnemann calls them the characteristic symptoms often. And in the mental paragraphs from 210 to 221, he calls them Chief symptoms, out symptoms. So they're important, but they're not always characteristic. He uses a different word. Chief, is that chief? Chief, like chief sergeant, like mm -hmm. important, big sergeant. But so chief haupte is the word, major or chief. But he uses a different word than the word characteristic. So we look at them more sometimes like differentiating symptoms. If you look at the pathology or the Chief complaint, maybe there's a group of remedies, and you use the mental emotional maybe more as differentiating symptoms. They're not the most characteristic, but they're you know help you decide between this remedy and that remedy. That's right, but you don't always know if they're going to be helpful or not. Everyone has emotions, everyone has feelings and thoughts. And uh, so when are they useful homeopathically? And you don't know until after you finish taking the case can't decide beforehand that there's always going to be the mental symptoms. All right, now we come to the word stronger. Hahnemann uses the word stronger, right? It can't only be similar, but it has to be stronger than the natural disease, the, the medicinal disease, and he calls remedies, even homeopathy, a medicinal disease has to be stronger, or an artificial disease, has to be stronger than the natural disease that you're treating. So here's one of his examples. He takes a candle, you light a candle, it's got a little, if you go walk outside with that and put it in front of the sun, you won't see the 
candle flame anymore. So that to him was an analogy to a, a meta, for stronger and weaker similars. So the word stronger, there's the German word, refers to strength of healing energy, not to quantities or chemical amounts. Okay, this is a mistake that's easily to fall into because we're so educated in chemistry. So he further says, an aggravation is when there is a highly similar medicinal disease that's somewhat stronger than the original disease. It's not unusual because the remedy disease has to be a little bit stronger than the natural disease. Of course, we minimize it as much as possible. But it's often uh, so fast or so minor that people don't feel it. But it always has to be a, a stronger medicinal disease. And he's saying the succussion or the dynamization or the potentizing makes it stronger. So that's the opposite of chemistry strong, right? Where you have more chemicals. My nanoparticles, check the issue. You know, the nanoparticles get smaller, they fire surface areas, they become more reactive. Okay. So that is, how do you say, if you're into modern chemistry, that helps you get into the idea of homeopathy. And then he says 279, it can never be too small. So under 90 hours, you're not done yet. Okay. So you can do more. All right. Now let's uh, distinguish this between the word large, which is in German there. So large, when Hahnemann uses that language, does refer to physical amounts of quantity or chemistry. And here's some examples from aphorisms. So for instance, uh, is it is on this page or the next page? Malaria, so quinine, we can use homeopathic, China, cinchona for malaria, at least in the past. Or it can also have an effect in material, large doses. However, if you happen to use a large dose, a physical quantity of the similar, the correct similar remedy, you substitute a new disease for the old disease. The new disease being the side effects, as we call them in regular medicine. The side effects are the new disease, even though you might have extinguished most of the malarial symptoms with large doses of quinine. You get the side effects of quinine and a new disease. And if you're proving remedies, if you give large doses, you get symptoms all over the place and they're confusing and you don't have a timeline and subtle differences are blotted out by the poisoning of large doses. Oops. All right. Any questions there? Large versus strong versus small. So, so uh, would I be correct if I said, Dr. Uh, Shepard, that large means lower potencies or less potentization and stronger doses means higher potencies and more potentization? Yes, but you're crossing over two languages there, chemical language and homeopathic language. So homeopaths don't say that their 6x is a large dose. They call it a low potency. But, but if, you're, if you're thinking chemistry, then it's larger because the chemical amount is still there. What was I reading about those uh, forever chemicals? The toxicity is now going to be set at four parts per trillion. So around a 9x, right, in homeopathic terms. So if that's uh, to a regular doctor, that's a small MR, but to a homeopath, those are large because there's chemistry still involved. Okay. okay. All right. So then we have the word specific, or specificum in Latin. Hahnemann uses this word more often than the word similimum. In modern times, for some reason, homeopaths prefer the word similimum to specificum. He says, find the most spe fitting homeopathic specific remedy. You want the specific dynamic distunement. You want a natural medicine that has its own power. It's specific and has specific medicinal powers. So, why this Latin? So here's an example of a treatise 
Brown Hahnemann's time, that routinely, whatever country it was, if it was in Europe, it was a medical treatise, they would write it in Latin. Latin was standard. So near the bottom there, you can see what the, what the, the difference there for specificum for vipra, the, you know, the snake, and, and, and anadoni. So Hahnemann's use of the word similar in similimum Latin or specificum was not unusual in that time for medical writings. All right. So the word smellipum is only mentioned once in the whole organon in a footnote. And it's mentioned in a phrase that talks about the action of finding the similar symptoms, right? So the specificum is the ex actual exact remedy itself, whereas finding the similar remedy is a methodology. Okay. So this can be a specificum if we have the assumptions in homeopathy that each person's disease is unique and individual. Each person's remedy is individualized and becomes the specific. And each curative medicine is a specific. There's an example in journals called the Similum, and I don't know any journals called the Specificum. It's herring, by the way. All right. So, of course, the descriptor that we're all familiar with as homeopaths is similar. So what, uh, what points do I want to make here? Similar mean similar symptoms. But again, we have a language problem. When Hahnemann uses the German word for symptoms, it meant the subjective and the objective. So in modern medical usage, the symptoms are subjective, qualitative. The patient's feelings observed about themselves. And signs in modern medicine are the objective, quantitative, measurable. And doctors don't rely on the sub subjective. They only believe the objective as being more real or more truthful. But when they do that, how much of the whole truth or how much of the whole reality are they ignoring? In homeopathy, we don't ignore the whole reality. So anyway, symptoms here mean all of them, all of it, signs and symptoms and situations, right? Like if you get a chest, a patient comes in with chest pain, you want to know if they ate three pizzas and had indigestion. You want to know if they were in a car accident and the steering wheel hit their chest. Or you want to know if they have a history of heart disease. So you do need the circumstances. The signs and symptoms and circumstances are all together in the word symptom in the organ. The next point is that this similar symptoms, not similar symbol, symbolism, similar categories, similar types, similar archetypes, similar psychology. Hahnemann says what's perceptible, what's manifest, what's observable should be what's similar. How many times he talks about this? Here's a bunch of the paragraphs that he uses that similar symptoms. And in fact, the first part of the organon where he introduces all the evidence to point to the law of similars, even in bold type in the original German edition, and there's the German phrase, is the culmination of the first part of the organon, paragraph 60, 50, and says in English, cure through symptom similarity. Okay. Here's the visual for the word similars. This is a novel, a mystery story by some author who was experienced homeopathy in his life. It wasn't that good of a book. <laughs> All right. So, summary. So over here we have that symbol, sum total, or some of the terms. So to get consistent results, you have to have all these qualitative descriptors. Correct. All right. Anything else people want to mention? 
if I get another done. So Dr. Fior, maybe you can tell me how to eject here, I think. Oh, I got one more picture. This is uh, the original sixth edition of the Organon, which is available for viewing at the University of San Francisco uh, Medical School Library Special Collections. And you can touch it, you can leap through it. What Hahnemann did was he took the printed of the, you know, uh, edition of the fifth edition and then made corrections in, hand, in his own hand. But you can see here, this is 1833. All right, now it's done. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Dr. Shepard, I have a question, and that is, um, so Hahnemann talked about the cure of the L-14 for the 15 millesimal in the, his last organ. When he had his big celebrated practice in France and later in his life, did he routinely and exclusively use the 15 millesimals, or did he just do them some, or was it just a theoretical thing when he said this could work? It was a transition. So what it appears to be that when he moved to Paris, their lifestyle, people weren't healthy. Whereas if most of his life he treated German farmers, strong, independent people, and he could use those single potencies and they would respond. He moves to Paris under dissolute lifestyle, regime, whatever. And he found that the, the remedies were too strong, they would aggravate too much. So he transitioned to a way that they were still strong but less aggravated. So, lifestyle, modern times is more like what Paris was back then. So, then using remedies in the group is more easy in modern times. But when people are so sick, sometimes it's just not strong enough to get pushing much longer. So, we have in our office, we would use a more practical interpretation of the LM potencies for the dissolved two levels of glasses in one. Stir it. So, that's not exactly an LM, but it's close to it. And then we can adjust by how many times you stir it, the pellets you put in, how much of the water you drink, how frequently you take it. And instead of ascending LM1 or Q1, Q2, Q3 in exact ways, so in practice, I use a little both. We were talking about the 200 versus the Q potencies in the animals. So it's kind of the same idea what we do by using some dry some liquid versus some liquid. Thank you. That it does seem to moderate the aggregation. Thank you. 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 So the liquid doses actually seem to, and the dry doses seem to interfere with a little bit with each other because it's slightly different. And it seems to moderate the aggravation, but it also seems to allow the remedy to have a longer time before we can use it before we wear it. Hmm. Even though the thing that can kind of uh, uh, his approach was to get a single dose and wait six months or three months or something like that. But it, and it's interesting, he couldn't treat patients with serious disease or cancer. He didn't treat guinea pig. I think he died guinea pig. Uh, he didn't, his way, his concept of the pathology of how to give remedies was not correct for those diseases. It was correct for other diseases, you know, maybe lesser diseases. Just even though they were always on the mind. And so then the mind is higher part of the body and therefore needed the highest potencies. So we would always use high potencies one at a time because he thought the interference would interfere with them. Which is not the lead approach to it because he saw that they were able to stimulate the body toward in the healing direction. Nothing interferes with that, but one doesn't be enough. But we do interfere with it with, with lots. Um, you know, Kent was a high potency prescriber because higher vibration meant higher mind. And if you were physically ill, then you just didn't need to do But to him, disease was always from the mind. That's fucked. 
So high potency versus low potency, which has always been a conflict within me. I've got patients where I've tried highest potencies and they just disrupted the case or aggravated them or didn't help. And then I go down to the same remedy in the low potency and all of a sudden they're feeling better. So there's lots of things. And you know, if it's all energy, whether it's four ounces of water or five ounces, it should make a difference. Yeah. It does. Some patients are that sensitive. But what is the boundary you use uses like a two foot, one drop? And it's too much for some people. One drop, maybe too thick, maybe wipe it, maybe put it on the tongue, maybe put it on the cheek, maybe put it on the arm, maybe put it on the toenail, maybe put it on the heel. I mean, it actually has a phrase there, but there are a thousand different sensitivities. A thousand fold difference in sensitivity, therefore, you can prescribe remedies in a thousand different ways. I've had patients who will start off with stuff low and go high, and then all of a sudden they get really sensitive and have to go back down here. I'm thinking you can get really to go back in 30 or in water or whatever. And then sometimes they lose that and they go back up again. Yeah. Yeah. That's all the experience from me. Just lots of experience and just use your best time. And why it's so labor intensive you know, to communicate with the patient often. Think the animals are a good example. How much placebo effect during those animals that care how close the connection is with their caregiver? Lots of pathology here. Totally disappointing. I'm treating my son's cat. It was a kidney failure. Follow up blood tests and the UN and creatinine the most. Wow. The veterinarian said, well, he's got four weeks to live. Then he got pancreatitis. Mm -hmm. He ran. He was totally disappeared. So, so babies, right? two little kids in the office are under pregnancy for six. And one child with 104 feet of red hot drive. Within their ears, both ears are infected. Parents, first time with homeopathy, and so let's give the doses out of 10 and then we started to talk about what homeopathy was. And then all of a sudden, these babies not crying anymore. The redness is gone. Mm -hmm. So that mother of that child, and she's done raising kids, she went back and became mm -hmm. So Let's see it sometimes, right? That size is around here. Little baby, 10 M. You know, you don't go by weight. That always gets me on allopathic Tylenol and acetamin. Those bottles, how do you decide how much to give your child? What factors do they use? Age, weight. And what if they have Parkinson's? What if they have kidney failure? What if they haven't eaten in 10 days? What if they, you know, they didn't drink? All these variables, how do they figure out what the right dosage is for a kid? For vaccinations, you get the same quantity, whether you're a big kid or a little kid or a sick kid or a wild kid. You know, it's just ridiculous. What's the science of it? Same thing for babies. There's a YouTube who's been that's talking about that. You get a little tiny dog versus a big dog, and you do the same dose for the baby's vaccination. And, and there's an immense problem to that. And shots, too. Yeah, Dr. Lynn always said the same thing. He said exactly what you guys just said. You know, if you have a sickly kid or a really tiny kid versus a big, robust kid, and they all get the same one size fits all shot. He felt that vaccines weren't necessarily a legal thing. It was just that they just weren't individualizing it. And of course, there's no room in vaccine protocol to individualize at all. When you make a medicine that's supposed to be treating people like cattle or something, you know, you want to get a lot of numbers through. 
the only way to do it is not to individualize, you just treat the whole population. But um, homeopathy is, if anything, proof that you can't do. But in conventional medicine, that's that's there's more profit when you treat the population. Yeah, there's no way to do homeopathy. When it, when it, you know, not saying that's an insult, but well, it's true. Compared to pharma. You know, yeah, but when you're, you know, remedies like what, 12 bucks, maybe 10 bucks, depending on what you take. Mm -hmm. I'd rather pay $20 for something to work or maybe not work other than here's a pill for a viral infection. Like, no, that's all, all stuff for crazy things. <laughs> and you have medicines that are made in stones that are made in the TV. They're still working. Yeah. I think that's why uh, naturopathic medicine and homeopathic medicine can really, you know, so beautiful in conjunction because it's so synergistic. Because we can't just prescribe sulfur to every person who walks in the office just because they're hot and sweaty. And, and you know, might like spicy food. Like, okay, sulfur is something I use for every person who likes spicy food. Well, if they're not so I'm not type. <laughs> what if they're only one, maybe 60, 70s? So I don't know all of them, but. Well, Hahnemann in his lifetime had a, up to 100 remedies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is similar enough? Mm -hmm. So, this question in only that term, similar enough is not a theory, mm -hmm. philosophical question. If it works, it's similar enough. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't cure everything, you go on to the next best remedy. Mm -hmm. You know, if I carry my little first aid kit and I'm in the phone with you and have an emergency, I only have. Forty. Mm -hmm. I still pick the best of those forty. Mm -hmm. If they're in my office and we have only over a thousand, still pick the best of a thousand. But there's more than that. Mm -hmm. that we have. How many species? Eight point four million. How many minerals? Over four thousand. How many? So how many potential remedies are there? We don't even know about, but we can still do a lot. We just have to follow the case. And if this picture changes, you change. There are other eight to ten million species of animals and plants, and God knows how many minerals and other things. I looked at four thousand four hundred. It was a bottle of natural minerals. Four thousand four hundred. It's one geology. Now they've discovered some new ones, like you know, deep in those crust and so on. But they may be up to six thousand. Mm -hmm. How many minerals do we have in the Catholic literature? Mm -hmm. Plus all the chemicals you can make artificially. Mm -hmm. Plus all the substances the Dow has to use. Like we can use to make remedies out of all those things. Dr. Shep, what's your opinion about it? I know Dr. Farouk asked you, this is a lot of uh, you have to be prepared on the of medicines. Hmm. So they, you know, they bring out the top of the, the, of the drug, of the energy of the drug. And if the person is not strong, then they get that disease by the surface. If they're strong, they can throw it off as a healing process. You know, antidote or isoprene, whatever word you want to use. So an example. When I first started practice, uh, the water of life treatment was popular, which is drinking all the urine. Mm -hmm. So why did that even be considered to work? Well, what's in the urine? The toxin that the body's trying to rid of in the body cells. So if you take a very small amount of your urine, you take a large homeopathic dose of the toxins that your body doesn't want, need or want or that are making you sick. So you get an aggravation. Of what those toxins can do. And if you're a strong person, you go through the aggravation, it comes out on your skin and everywhere, and then you get better. But most people in this country, I want to speak of, aren't strong enough for that to happen successfully. It gets stuck. So the urine just makes them sicker. That's something to add to that. So I use it a lot. Um, but I'll do like a constitutional first to get the more balance because the kids are with are like very, very sick. <laughs> so I usually don't introduce that until probably like four, five, six months, like in care. 
Yeah, because I've seen that happen. So if they're not strong, it should bring out the symptom picture more clearly. But yeah. It doesn't come up. Yeah. So it's useful that way. Okay. And then what potency do you typically prescribe? I like muscle tests a lot too. So it's yeah, we're not allowed to learn that here. You're allowed to do whatever you want. You pay them. <laughs> but I hear you. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to get yelled at for using home mouth in clinic because like, I know it works. I believe in it. Yes, I'm a believer. I never knew really about homeopathy, but then once I used it for the long standing grief that I experienced after losing a father at age 21. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, staff said, and, and many other remedies, but that was definitely like the most complete remedy. Cool. The condoms and the pills, too. Very good for the shock. So, not. Yeah. Oh, we are not love homeopathy. We talk about it all the time. People know me as like one of the homeopathy masters. Are they guys using it for me? Yeah, people just say they oh, they don't like any yeah. thing. We do use it in clinic, but just people really don't like it because it takes time. They want like a quick fix, you know, something else. Yeah. Yeah. It depends on the patient. Yeah, I know when I was in clinic, I picked my clinician because she was the only one that was like supervising the homeopathy and I was like a clinician for us. Dr. Green? Yeah. Yeah, it's still like that, but. Julia Green. Uh, Julia Green. She was a speaker. She was, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was Julia Lee back from the Yeah, I think she liked homeopathy, but she left before. I just mean like neck back injuries from what I have to do. Saying, hey, you want to go through a rotation down the road? Like, nah, I don't want to come out with that much. Long as now you get modality, possibly for the normal. I was telling the Nashville students, it's like, I mean, there's, yeah, there's green allopathy, and there's, I mean, in some states, natural tasks get licensure are very similar to the MDEs, but it's super slow. When you give up the vitalism, that's really what distinguishes naturopathy from medical doctors. And if you give that up, I mean, basically, you go the way of the DOs. I mean, mostly DOs, some of them are holistic, but very few. Most are just practicing healthy medicine. I mean, there's exceptions, but the profession as a whole has gone in that direction and, and is not really distinct. Mm -hmm. right. I think a lot of the reason why they probably don't like it is because they don't understand it, but they haven't seen it. Before. That's true. That also gives you a chance. Yeah, if they want to learn it, they can learn it. Well, there's lots of practical problems. Yeah. Practicing yeah. Yeah. Uh, debt, social requirements, personal requirements, and those. I mean, I believe it's not even practical. Or, and you can look down on people. Choose not to do anything. You do decide to do it, you have to really use the person's sake. Essentially, what I'm saying is, I don't feel like people devote their life to home now to be like to Just to clear the air, I'm not angry. Like, these people do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. I just find the home now to be is amazing, and I'd rather have a $10, you know, run me a month than what $150 is. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, any last uh, minute questions from the webinar or from here live? I have something. Uh, Bob, hi to you. Hi, Hi. Uh, does anybody know whatever happened uh, to that bill that was supposed to be signed by the Senate for the? over-the-counter homeopathic remedies? That's a great question. In fact, I was just wondering that last night. Tim, did you have anything to say about it? It's That's Americans for Homeopathy Choice. Or, yeah. I, yeah. I don't know where that stands. So is it totally a, a done deal and it's all signed and everything? Oh or is it, so I, it's still, I, I don't know. It, it's still a work in progress, know. apparently. Is anyone working with Americans for Homeopathy Choice? 
North and so on. In every state, they have certain representatives that are going to see uh, their federal representatives for the state senators and Congress people. Yeah. So I don't we're not, we're not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, thank you very much to Dr. Laura Weiss and Dr. Joel Shepard. Excellent presentations. Uh, and just, um, just don't forget, uh, let's see. Uh, next one is going to be there. Uh, Saturday, April 15th at 10 o'clock. See you then. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. We end it and then we can. Uh...